Hello, good evening, everyone from Mumbai. Welcome to Inclusive Cities. Last week, we uh, missed a session due to some tech issues. Uh, we were very sorry that we couldn't make it, but we are very happy to be back with you. I hope you missed us. But uh, today we have two amazing guests, so we are definitely going to make up for last week's mishap. As you know, I'm Elsa Marie De Silva, founder and CEO of Red Dot Foundation, and along with Pratima Manohar, uh, founder and CEO of the Urban Vision, we host every week on Wednesdays the Inclusive Cities Livecast, and we bring to you guests from our network from all over the world to help us decode what it means you know, to have a safe and inclusive city. So, and this we are doing as part of the Stanford uh, Center for Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law's Leadership for Change uh, Network. So without further ado, I want to introduce, I want to hand it over to my uh, partner, uh, Pratima Manohar. Thank you, Elsa, and uh, welcome to Inclusive Cities. Uh, today we're going to discuss uh, civic engagement and how tech can enable governments to serve people better and also empower citizens to hold governments accountable. It's a little bit of a varied topic from inclusive cities, but I think it's crucial to achieve the agenda of inclusive cities. And I'm so excited uh, to have our two guests here today. Uh, we have Matt Tempek, uh, who's actually a classmate of mine. Uh, we took a class on civic media uh, in Boss in MIT uh, a long time ago under uh, Ethan Zuckerman, and uh, he is a senior researcher at Civic Hall, where he curates the Civic Tech Field Guide. Uh, and he's been researching and building civic technology since 2005. Uh, and making creative contributions to electoral and social campaigns for national and city governments uh, and academia and journalism. So thank you, Matt, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, and we also have Namrata Kilpari, uh, who all of you know from the recent Urban Thinkers Campus we hosted. Uh, Namrata is a campaign strategist at change.org, which has been the a petition website of choice for a lot of us to campaign against uh, civic issues that is close to our heart. Uh, and they've been kind of enabling social movement and enabling kind of a digital platform for social movements uh, for a long, long time. So thank you, Namrata, for uh, joining us as well. And uh, how have you both been during this last uh six months of a very crazy year matt um pretty well i'm here in berlin and um yeah i think in the grand scheme of things we're doing quite well um so just just laying low and spending more time on computers than ever before how about you namrita uh i think i'm sort of doing the same as matt uh, also trying to just stay sane uh take a, take care of myself because uh it's quite easy when you're working from home to have no separation between work and yeah. uh, the rest of your life. So try to keep burnout at bay. And but at the same time, work is so gratifying. So it can be pretty hard to kind of switch off. Yeah. OK, so my first question, Matt, uh, is you know, how, can you kind of talk to us a little bit about how we can use technology to not just enable civic engagement, but also to increase accountability in uh, our governments? Yeah, sure. It's my favorite topic. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think um, when we talk about tech for government accountability, we we get into power dynamics, right? And a lot of civil society groups try to stay away from that word. Sometimes there's tax implications, like in the US, if you start talking about elections or power. Um, and other times, just for civil civility, they stay away from it. But if we actually want to hold government accountable and, you know, get something done in the world. There's often a lot of um, you know, pushback against changing the status quo, no matter what that is. We have to organize with other people. And that's where I get excited about the role of tech, uh, platforms like change.org, and even more simple things like a WhatsApp group can go a long way to organize people. So it's not always super crazy emerging tech. Sometimes it is like AI, 
but a lot of times it's just the ability to communicate each other with each other and the ability to share information in new ways opens up new possibilities for us to gain power and to hold government accountable. That's definitely not a given, but um, I get excited where we can actually win battles that maybe in the past we didn't have enough money, we didn't have enough you know traditional power. Now there's a bit more opportunity. Namrata? I think you're on mute, Namrata. Sorry, Pratima, can you just repeat the question? I sort of missed the beginning of what you before, before Matt spoke. Um, you know, talk to us a little bit about how we can use technology for civic engagement, but also to keep our governments accountable. Um, I think digital campaigning is something that a lot of people are beginning to discover now, given the unprecedented kind of time that we are going through in globally with uh, a virus pretty much grounding all of us and setting us indoors. So uh, traditionally, if it hadn't been for a pandemic, a lot of us would have preferred to go and meet uh, people in government, allies, uh, supporters uh, in person, go door to door and campaign in the old sense. Um, but increasingly, that's something that is less and less feasible and also not safe currently. So that's why I think a dig like digital tools are what citizens and uh, activists need to start getting accustomed to so as to be able to take their causes uh, to uh, those in power uh, when when the need when the need arises that's where uh, a platform like the one that i work at which is change.org uh, that's what we are trying to do during the pandemic especially is to uh, pr provide a platform to people everywhere to create the kind of change that they want to see um, in a nutshell, I mean, for me, inclusive cities um, and the agenda that we're trying to discuss today is about making sure that everybody is included and counted in uh, whenever we're talking about any debates uh, to do with um, development and what have you. Uh, Matt, would you like to give us an example of a civic tech or online campaign that has enabled urban change? Yeah, sure. Um, Black Lives Matter was by far for me the biggest one this year. And it's not just tech, right? It's cross cutting across all the places that racism shows up in society. Um, and then I also think it's interesting to follow examples of campaigns that aren't just about pushing more tech usage. So in India, you have Rethink Ahar about, you know, what are the surveillance effects of a national identity? Uh, in Toronto, the group Stop Sidewalk with Bianca Wiley was able to actually fight and beat Google's plans for the smart city with lots of sensors and tax money going to Google. And then um, also with facial recognition, that's a technology that might not be good for society, at least the, the current version of it definitely isn't. And so there's groups organizing around the world to put bans in cities on the use of facial recognition, especially by police or immigration authorities. So I think it's interesting to follow both where tech helps us organize and also which tech do we have to organize against. And that's interesting, Matt, because, you know, uh, my organization, Red Dot Foundation, has a crowd map for sexual and gender-based violence. It's called Safe City. And my colleague in the U.S., she's a professor of criminology. And several years ago, she, her class actually started to collect data on, uh, uh, you know, police use of brutal force on the Black uh, community and uh, to show the racial injustice. And it was hard to find the data. And she always said that, you know, the crowd map that we have should be extended to also include this racial injustice, because unless you have the data, it's very hard to prove it. And then it becomes one story and you'll find all the fault with the person who is in the vulnerable situation rather than you can prove a trend where the police are actually at fault. And maybe investment needs to be done in their cultural sensitivity or their uh, the way they handle and de-escalate a crisis, et cetera. So it's, I, I love your example, and it's very pertinent and relevant at the current uh, moment. Um, let's move to Namrata. Namrata, how does uh, change.org help in uh, something like this, you know, especially with urban uh, focus? Um, 
So I really love the example Matt used of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, that's something that has uh, gone viral on beyond the US. Uh, there's a movement of the same nature in Brazil, also in Germany and different parts of Europe. We also saw repercussions of um, the conversation in India because uh, India is a country that's obsessed with colorism, which is discrimination based on your skin tone. We've all seen those matrimonial site ads asking for the fair wheatish bride. We've also seen a brand like Unilever being uh, schooled by uh, citizens saying, what is this fair and lovely nonsense? You know, all, all shades are lovely. So uh, we've seen our platform being used increasingly by citizens to start these conversations or take these conversations forward. Um, I, I, um, Pratima, if you can share your screen, uh, I shared with you um, a few campaigns, if you can move to slide four. I just thought I'll run you through some of the campaigns that we've been working on, which touch on um, on inclusivity. Yeah, so this is a campaign which is started by Virali Modi. She's a disability rights activist. And she's actually talking about spatial inclusion, which is to make Indian railways uh, disabled friendly. And she's asking for measures like more spacious compartments, privacy in terms of curtains, uh, training for porters and railway staff about how to deal with someone who uh, is struggling with um, different cap cap capabilities. Um, if you move on to, to the next few slides, uh, one by one, you'll see that uh, there are campaigns that are also, uh, so this, this campaign by Virali actually led to some kind of impact with so many lakhs of people signing. Uh, there's a train junction in Kerala where all the measures that she, she was asking for have actually been implemented. And Virali did this from Mumbai uh, with citizens all over India connecting with her. Uh, if you move to the next one, we've also done a lot of campaigns on social inclusion. And uh, there are so many conversations now about pride and the LGBTQ movement. So uh, this was a campaign which actually uh, started out by asking Zomato to stop supporting restaurants that um, are uh, anti-LGBTQ. Uh, what Zomato ended up doing was uh, in adding a filter to their app where you, when you're looking for restaurants, you can actually identify um, a, a, a restaurant which is LGBTQ friendly. So instead of just knowing whether um, whether there's live music or whether they have a DJ, you also get to know if this is an inclusive restaurant. So people are increasingly using the platform to have these kind of conversations about access to spaces for people, be they in wheelchairs or people who are increasingly discriminated on the basis of their identity. Sorry, can you, uh, so, you know, I think the question that I have for both of you is a little bit more personal, but are there specific social or environmental challenges that you wish to see, uh, you know, you're, you're most eager to see application of technology change or drive change in? Matt? Yeah. And give us examples um, of, you know, platforms that you love as well. Great, uh, I've just got two. Um, you know, it relates to Black Lives Matter and racism. The criminal justice system in the U.S. is just wildly outdated, even even as far as status quo systems go. Plus, it was built on the racist underpinnings of slavery originally, right? So there's a ton of work to do at the federal, state, local level on criminal justice in the U.S. The good news is there are projects that kind of get called justice tech. So projects to help bring back the idea of justice to the criminal justice system. Um, some are... They're not perfect, right? Some are like trying to use algorithms to uh, chain to help a judge determine how long someone should be sentenced uh, once they're found guilty. You can imagine how if you have a bad data set, that's going to lead to bad outcomes for an AI model. And do we want a black box algorithm determining sentences anyway? But there's also really great efforts um, within Justice Tech. Code for America has a tool called Clear My Record, which is really simple. Um, in California, if you have uh, a marijuana conviction on your criminal record, um, you can actually get it expunged. You can get it removed from your record. Not many people knew that, and it was a very bureaucratic process to have to figure out how to do that. And in the meantime, this was preventing people from getting jobs, getting apartments, all kinds of social benefits. So Code for America just built an app called Clear My Record 
that help people quickly figure out how to clear their record of this this conviction that really society doesn't treat marijuana convictions quite the same anymore, especially in California, where it's legal now. The idea of people being in prison for it or, or facing social stigma decades later after serving jail time is just wild. So that's one of my favorites in the social space. And then environmentally, I think there's a ton of work we need to do around climate change. Um, the way I think about it is just the scale at which society needs to transition. We, we need to buy ourselves time. So even if we shift to 100% renewable energy today, we're flying less due to COVID, but we're still flying less, we still need a lot of work. So I look at you know technologies um, that might help capture methane from gas sites. And at the individual level, even just knowing um, what time of day to use your electricity, getting that information feedback loop is something that might be a more consumer tech kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it costs the consumer more to run the dishwasher at peak, and that's when most of the coal burning happens. So I think there's huge potential there too. So just two. Yeah, I love the. Uh, have you seen the Good Guide, which kind of gives indicators on social and environmental profiles of consumer items? That's that's great. And I remember when we were in Boston, there was an app uh, called C Click Fix. Do you remember that? where you could report non-emergency civic issues uh, in your community and uh, you'd have either community leaders or the government come and fix things um, i changed my city in india yes it's doing the same thing same thing right yes it's so the cool. same it's, i think it's the same platform as well they've used the same platform to do that cool. so yeah it's uh, so those kind of civic action platforms are uh, amazing Namrita? Um, you know, when I uh, when you asked the question, I was thinking like what issues environmentally haven't been worked on? And it's really hard to come up with something. But I like uh, like what Matt said. I think it's important to elevate the conversations that are happening about climate change. Uh, I would love to see a campaign where uh, there is a climate friendly criteria uh, for, for politicians or people who enter parliament. Uh, you know, I would love for them to be graded on an index of what kind of work they are doing to reduce the carbon footprint in their own constituencies and to have people, uh, you know, elect such uh, environmentally mindful people. Because I think that uh, also there are so many more campaigns that can be run in terms of just having uh, climate change as part of the curriculum in schools, because I'm not sure what uh, children are being actually taught about within in their in their textbooks. Uh, and the Gretas and the Aman Sharmas of the world are just a, a bunch of really empowered children who are doing something. But I feel like this is an entire generation that is having a conversation. And I'd love to see more campaigns by, by the youth on climate change and, and plastic and interpreting that in their everyday sense. It could even be uh, having you know uh, garbage segregation at the household level. There's just so many, so many um environmental challenges that uh, i mean where does one begin i think you can just begin anywhere i want to point and those are sorry <laughs> sorry i know Pranama, you also like the points that they've made you know and i'm reminded of my six-year-old niece who when uh, we went to goa and we were returning back at the airport you know we have those uh, waste bins right with say that uh, this is a green bin and this is some you know for recyclables and she was very conscious she went and put it in the right bin because she lives in uh, singapore and you know was taught in which bin you have to put the waste and then she came back very distressed saying but that man put it in the wrong bin <laughs> and she was about to give him a lecture and i was like this is india you know people don't really uh, respect and it's really about respect in a way. It's a res it's respecting uh, whether it's Black Lives Matter, or respecting your fellow human beings, or environmental and climate change issues, where you respect all you all beings on this uh, planet. So, Matt, you raised a very important point about technology, and uh, you know the algorithms. And we all know that bad, you know, garbage in is garbage out. And therefore, if the data is biased to begin with, or if the design of that technology is biased, it's going to reflect um, more harm than good. So what do you think can be done to ensure that technology is inclusive? A huge question. Um, 
I think first of all, you know, protections, regulation needs to happen. Like it can't just be up to the individual consumers. You know, if, if a tech company gives me a bunch of free services, I'm going to use it. Right. And so will everyone else. Um, so that's why we have government is to step in and protect people and set some rules. So you're seeing some examples of, uh, in New York city, there was an algorithmic review board and then there was a shadow algorithmic review board when they didn't like their findings to help set, you know, if an algorithm is going to determine where your child goes to school in New York city, or whether you get public housing or not in New York city, you should get some redress, some kind of some backup for that algorithm and help people understand how it works. And also what happens if it doesn't work. Um, so that's number one is protections. Number two is just literacy. So, um, and I think of inclusive literacy. So two of my favorite programs are in Boston, Emerson university came up with sort of a, a community review process of research. So rather than just experiment on top of a community, uh, they actually bring the community in while they're designing an experiment around tech in public places. So the community has some say and is kind of a, a partner with agency in that research. Likewise, in New York City, the, the mayor's office of technology um, worked in Brownsville in Brooklyn to help you know test new technologies before rolling them out. I think we all saw with scooters and with Uber, the Silicon Valley approach is just kind of drop it into cities and we're all tripping over scooters on the sidewalk and see what happens. Um, this is an alternate approach, which is let's let the community sort of test run the tech before we roll it out more broadly. Uh, and then lastly, um, one thing I've really noticed, I moved to Germany two years ago from the US. I didn't realize the extent to which my own imagination of what the public sector can do in tech if it's you know well-funded and, and regarded. So my own expectations of public sector tech weren't that great. And then since being here, I've seen you know the coronavirus tracking app in Germany is open source and it's considered like a really good one put out by the government. And then also there's a tool to aggregate all the ways to get around a city, whether that's scooters or bike share or the public transportation. And that app is run by the public transportation company and they actually require mobility providers to let you buy tickets for each form in one app. So like it's one of the best transit aggregation apps I've ever used and it's by the public utility. So I think just having a strong public sector when it comes to building technology can also make things more inclusive. And I think it's a matter of trust, isn't it? Because uh, when I was talking to a mayor in New Zealand, she said uh, that one of the reasons why uh, they did so well as a country in handling uh, the coronavirus pandemic was a there was clear communication right from the leadership on a daily basis to trust the trust relationship between government and citizens is so high prior to the pandemic that during the pandemic the citizens of course some of them were upset but by and large they followed the orders they followed the instructions and they um you know they went with whatever decision was made because they knew it was in their interest but where trust is poor and communication is weak it's a double whammy of sorts but it's an interesting example and i'm going to check it out because uh, i think we need more of those public uh, uh, public sector uh, innovations to take place uh, namrata would you like to share yeah um I think that what's happening a lot is that uh, conversations on um, on decisions that impact man many lives are not really inclusive to begin with. These processes need to be more consult consultative, more participatory. The communities who are most affected by the changes that are going to be brought about need to be brought into conversations. Um, I remember last year I was in Mumbai uh, to um, meet a group of citizens. Uh, sorry, I don't know if you can. We can hear oh, you. Sorry. I, sorry, if you can hear barking, that's not me. That's Thor, my puppy, whom I adopted recently. Um, sorry, I was saying uh, last year I was in Mumbai uh, to meet a group of citizens who were protesting the building of a, a coastal road project. Uh, and their biggest grouse really with that whole project was that citizens were not really being consulted and even the consultations that were held was seemed more like a sham uh, where uh, you know there were no discussions it just felt like a formality that was being conducted 
uh, and they had so many reasons for uh, opposing that project because of the environmental impact it would have also the fact that uh, almost 12800 crore rupees which is an insane number of zeros uh, was of public money was being invested in a project that was only going to, uh, I believe, uh, benefit about 2% of the population, whereas the city is already grappling with floods during the monsoon. It has a public uh, transport system that's practically collapsed. Um, and uh, what they really wanted was to be heard. And I feel like if, if policies are really uh, going to be successful, it's important for citizens to be a part of those conversations throughout that process. You know, the big promise of uh, civic tech has been um, this whole agenda around almost redistributing governance in the hands of local communities and creating this kind of ecosystem of public problem solvers. And especially uh, for cities and urban development, that seems like such a great idea because it's really challenging to run our mega cities. You know, Mumbai, for example, is a city of 18 million people. Um, you know, each of those little neighborhoods are almost like a small European town. So, you know, there's so much of local intelligence that can be harnessed. And that was the big promise of uh, civic tech and that is the big promise of uh, civic tech to kind of enable and unleash the energy of local citizens in problem solving uh, matt what how would you describe the you know it globally uh, how would you describe the kind of uh, status of civic tech ecosystem for better cities and uh, what's your hope for future for this big agenda um, Matt, you're uh, on mute. Yeah, just trying to eliminate my own background noise. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a puppy. Um, yeah, it, it's true. And I definitely hear Namrata's point that um, it's all too easy for officials to use public engagement as a way, as a shiny cover on what they wanted to do anyway. Mm -hmm. One um, solution to that I found, I was interviewing a number of different digital public engagement platforms this year and last year. Mm -hmm for the OECD and I, I published that research on Civicist. Um, and one way they got around that was just ensuring mass participation. And it's kind of funny, mm -hmm. one of the platforms, which is a private company, would run targeted advertising to ensure they had a high volume of participation and also mm -hmm. demographically representative volume of participation, which I thought was a pretty cool use of, you know, we don't all love targeted advertising, but way to use that for a pro-social reason, right? And, because especially when you can't do in-person workshops right now, uh, being yeah. able to reach a representative group in the city in large numbers, it gets more difficult for them to fake it in terms of the engagement. Um, and in terms of um, in terms of civic tech, like core civic tech, you know, public engagement tools. Some of my favorites right now are uh, Polis, P-O-L dot I-S, which mm -hmm. is used around the world, but especially in Taiwan. And, to me, it was a surprise because I, I thought I knew everything tech could do. And then Polish showed me there was something I didn't know, which is it finds unknown areas of consensus between opposing groups. So in Taiwan, you had the, introdu the introduction of Uber X and private car Uber drivers, and they wanted to know whether to keep it legal or not. And mm -hmm. through the V Taiwan process using Polis, they actually got all these Uber drivers, taxi drivers, citizens, all the stakeholders together. And it turned out they had areas of consensus. You know, they want drivers to be paid well, for example, was one area of consensus. So we hear a lot about how social media and technology divides us. And this is one example of a tool that actually becomes better the more people use it. The other digital public engagement platforms, there's two out of Spain, uh, Decide in Madrid, it's the console mm -hmm. project, and Decidem in Barcelona. These ones, they're, they, they're exciting to me because the cities are driving the development and they're they work as well or better as a lot of private sector startups with you know, funding. Um, and what's also cool about them is different cities around the world are adopting these open source platforms. And in some cases like Helsinki is even contributing back software development back to the project. So you have you know, cities with their limited budgets building pretty you know, cutting edge platforms and working together across different countries to make those platforms better for public engagement. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Matt. 
and i believe that is the way forward because collaboration is essential and uh, we can't have cities doing their own thing you know it's better that they use open source platform and uh, build stronger systems and i suppose if they all collaborate then they might uh, be subjected to the same regulations like gdpr because one of the reasons that citizens or individuals are afraid to use some of these apps is how is your data going to be used right so that's a very um, important question uh, namrata when we talk of online uh, platforms like yours how can one use it to design an effective campaign and what are some of the ways to engage supporters and networks to escalate the issue through the campaign uh, so often when people connect with us and say you know i want to do something about my city the do something uh, those are two words i really love hearing and then what is that something is is something that most people find very daunting because there is just like i said there are so many things you'd like to do so what we really recommend to people is to sort of imagine a big triangle which is like your big cause big issue like for example if you're a woman in delhi where i live uh, one of the top most things that most women talk about is feeling safe uh, most of us don't feel comfortable stepping out in the dark or by ourselves and if you ever leave home you're always sending your family your your uber coordinates so that somebody knows where you are so if uh, a woman from delhi uh, if a woman from delhi comes and says you know i want to make my city safer okay we say okay that's your big triangle and that's the goal you want to achieve um but how do you break that down into small actionable campaigns so it could be something like uh breaking it down into um let's say having safe security personnel at every metro station or having solar lighting outside every uh, bus terminal so that uh, there are no dark spots in the city so you know like breaking the larger ask of safety into smaller campaigns which are actionable they are smart in the sense of specific measurable achievable and you can direct those to a specific person or a specific department in governance that's one way to do it we also ask people to use um, other social media platforms twitter facebook instagram to connect with uh, there are so many groups online that are already working there are existing alliances that one can easily ally up with so i think um, we what we recommend is sort of thinking like starting with a small campaign uh, and then scaling it up as opposed to starting with something which is really big and unwieldy the ask may be something really amazing but very idealistic to work on and we also tell people that uh, more than just using data data is amazing data is can be very persuasive when you're talking to government but when you want to connect with people and build a support base it's important to tell a story uh, and and keep the data aside um so for example the the campaign i showed you uh, virali modi's campaign asking for uh, disabled friendly railways uh, she could have easily uh, used a lot of data uh, on the number of uh, differently able people in india or the kind of uh, you know the kind of hurdles they face and the data on that but instead she actually starts by talking about how she was groped by a porter who was who was supposed to help her get from her wheelchair into the the train or uh, into her seat uh, so i think um, aside from having a very specific campaign idea in mind it's important to tell a personal story about how an issue really affects you because what we've learned is that it's emotional connections to causes that actually take them to the next level thanks okay. namrata thanks namrata um you know one of the our professor at stanford cddrl the great political scientist francis fukuyama has been talking about how this pandemic has been a brutal test on democracies and governance worldwide and you know the you know governance structures and democracy is being kind of tested uh, put is being put through a brutal stress test um and you know we are obviously we are lots of different parts of the world that are already struggling with um you know governments that are taking advantage of the kind of emergency powers that these the pandemic has offered them uh, so i want to talk to uh, you matt about 
you know, how should we perceive the role of civic tech in achieving uh, not just tra transparency in governance, but to keep, um, you know, some of these power structures accountable, especially in, um, in a situation where they can be trampled on, uh, given the kind of uh, emergency powers that the state has suddenly got due to the pandemic. Yeah, we, we have some challenges in front of us, don't we? Yeah. Um, I, I love your point about um, about narrative and stories because, uh, yeah, it's just data alone isn't going to do it. And, right. you know, a lot of open government data advocates probably think this too, but you can't just fight to have a portal on a website, right? Like, that's not a fight. Right. I'm too much of an activist for transparency alone. It has to be, it's inherently political. It's inherently about power when you're talking right. about resources or government distribution. Um, and so what's your point of view, right? And who else has your point of view? And if they don't, if you're a minority or if you're traditionally discriminated against, how do you build power so that they have to hear your point of view? So, you know, I used to work for a group called the New Organizing Institute that was informed by a lot of Marshall Gans and Obama style organizing. And I learned there's these techniques like power mapping where you just map on an X, Y axis, you know, what's the influence of, everybody in the space and how close are they to your group in terms of proximity on the x-axis and you can map out your your enemies your allies your someday allies and you can begin to get people into your court and that's how you build power right it's relationships it's storytelling it's very little to do with data in terms of you know the core of what it is um, so for me the transparency alone and open government data alone although it's been successful in terms of being this idea that got picked up lots of places it has to be towards some end and it has to have a point of view and ideally it has to be leveraged towards achieving something in the world, not just, you know, open data for data's sake, because, you know, a thousand years from now, when we're all gone, the CSVs won't still be online. Right. Um, yeah. And it so has I'm, to be emotional. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you have to connect emotionally with the citizens. It can't be all just data and platforms on you know, sh showcasing corruption. And uh, we've become so divided now. And, you know, you seem to be in your own echo chambers, depending on what your ideology is. So it's, it's this crazy new world that we're living in. Elsa? Namrata, um, you know, that's, so Matt spoke about like from a citizen's perspective, but you know, one important stakeholder is the government, right? Like where you want to engage with them and through change.org, you can do that. But for a lay citizen, it's very hard to identify the right government agency. How can uh, your platform, you know, be inclusive enough to help them find that and also make it easy for them to reach those agencies? Um. I'm really happy that Matt actually spoke about uh, power mapping. We always do that when you're trying to identify the right person uh, to address a campaign to. So uh, I think government systems in India are deliberately structured in a way that they're meant to put you off. If you're a citizen and you look at the who's who of a government department, there are so many designations which make probably make no sense. There's a principal advisor, there's a chief advisor, and then you're like, who is the person I'm supposed to speak to? So we always talk about uh, mapping it on a on a on a on an axis, which talks about who has the most influence and who is the most likely to support you. Um, I remember we ran a campaign uh, with two citizens from East Delhi. Uh, they were really upset by uh, the Ghazipur landfill, which is actually Asia's largest landfill, and it was supposed to overtake the Taj Mahal in in height this year. I mean, imagine that would have made for really horrible headlines for uh, incredible India's tourism campaign. Um, and what they did was uh, initially they they addressed it to the chief minister of Delhi, uh, and then realized that uh, there are in Delhi there are there's a state government, but there are also municipal corporations who have a certain kind of power. And there are lots of turf battles. And the citizen ended up uh, tagging the petition to uh, multiple. She, she pretty much uh, addressed it to everybody she could think of. Uh, and then what really worked for her was the fact that uh, we were having general elections and um, a cricketer turned politician called Gautam Gambhir was contesting his first election from that very constituency. 
and he'd happened to talk about the landfill in one of his election speeches. So what uh, Seema, the woman who started this campaign did was she promptly uh, addressed her campaign to him once he won the election and said, hey, you were talking about clearing up this landfill, so let's get let's start working on it. And uh, you're right, it's, it's, it's one thing to identify the person, but how do you really get through to them? How do you make sure that they are uh, reading your emails or they're getting your messages? Because if you try calling up, just making cold calls, sometimes nobody really picks up. So um, what we noticed with this particular person in government was that he was extremely active on social media. And his Twitter page had uh, frequent updates about places he's visiting, the ribbons he's cutting, which is a way of saying inaugurating a project. So what uh, Seema did was she actually uh, got her 12,000 supporters. That was it, just 12,000 people. She sent them all an email with a link saying, tweet to this man. Tell him to pay attention to what I'm saying. And it was actually about 500 out of those 12,000 people who tweeted to Gautam Gambhir. Um, and that's actually how he took note of the campaign. And um, if exactly a year ago, inaugurated the cleanup of this landfill. Um, I believe a few days ago, uh, there, were, there were headlines um, in Delhi's papers that said that the landfill had actually reduced in height by 40 feet because of a campaign that a citizen started and got a parliamentarian to act on. So I think it's about being really clever with whom you're addressing your campaign to. Often in India, people believe that they need to address everything to the prime minister because he's the all-powerful leader and the chief of the government. But he may not have the authority really to, to clean up the landfill as much as the parliamentarian who, who made it happen could. So I think choosing um, the right decision maker, even if it's not the most popular or the most glamorous person, but the guy who's actually uh, most tech savvy in this case, um, choosing that and also being able to use technology like Twitter uh, to tweet bomb, as we call it, where 500 people send the same message to one person. It's pretty hard for him to miss those messages. And we are seeing we are seeing a ton of political leaders and government officials actually respond to Twitter, and uh, you know just even make specific policy decisions or also just kind of do a very simple bureaucratic task which should have been done anyway. We've seen that uh, here in India with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. If somebody didn't, in the past, we've had a minister who we could tweet to if we had any trouble getting our passports, for example. It's amazing how uh, technology has changed that kind of connection between government and citizens and i want to quickly take a moment at this point in time to say hello to the amazing inclusive cities uh, community that joins us uh, every week now it's been it, it started out as a kind of experiment uh, for elsa and i during the lockdown and it's continued and it's been such fascinating conversations um and i know young is kind of live uh, kind of uh, summarizing some of our conversation on LinkedIn. And uh, please let us know where all of you are today and how you're doing. Share your messages in the video chat box below. And if you have any comments or questions for Matt or Namrata, please feel free to ask them. Um, and Matt, uh, I my next question to both of you is that we have a lot of citizens uh, who watch this program, uh, are there kind of platforms or, um, you know, toolkits that they can kind of explore to um, make their own campaigns more successful? Are there, uh, you know, programs they can do to learn to build that narrative, uh, the storytelling narrative, or are there tech platforms you think is cool that citizens can access to push governments to recognize their concerns and agendas. Matt? I'm so glad you asked. Um, so what I do each week is I curate the Civic Tech Field Guide. Uh -huh. That's on civictech.guide, G-U-I-D-E. -E. And basically we have almost 4,000 different projects uh, from around the world. So you can look by India, you can look by country, city, um, basically either around government engaging citizens, 
or citizens taking political action and the tools and platforms. So there's lots of tools and platforms to answer your question succinctly. Um, and then uh, we also look at narrative tech. So we have a whole page about the, the role of narrative groups that like the narrative initiative that help people hone their stories and tell their stories. Um, and we also look at media and journalism. I think we haven't mentioned yet, but like the role of the journalist in contextualizing information, telling the story so that the public cares about something is a pretty huge link in all of this in the democracy and obviously has its own challenges these days. So we also track, you know, media tech and nonprofit journalism and, and tools like that. Um, but yeah, if uh, civic tech guide, and we have a whole section on campaigning and advocacy with all those platforms, most of which are free. I have just posted the link to civic tech guide for anybody to uh, kind of explore that directory of crowdsource civic tech tools and other um, kind of programming to become better at campaigning for your civic issues. Matt, do you like a few that make it to the top of your list from this guide? Yeah, for that you use for your own campaigns. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you mentioned C Click Fix. They're a great example yes. in terms of huge scale and uh, working with gov local governments to make sure an issue is actually fixed before they can resolve it. I think that's a pretty cool feature. Mm -hmm. I also love Change.org. I mean, the the global scale. And the work the change team does on the back end that you don't always necessarily see to help connect stories to journalists, to help, yeah, as uh, Namrata mentioned, to help improve the strategy of the campaign. I don't know if you know yeah. this, but in 2012, I was able to write a paper about the battle for Trayvon was the title of the paper. So Trayvon Martin was the biggest US news story in 2012. My hypothesis yeah. was that's because the change.org petition went viral, which it did. It was the largest of all time at that point, which is 2 million. I'm sure it's been passed now. Uh, but then the paper actually became about the interplay between a viral change.org petition and media. So a, a guy who does pro bono PR was able to get the story onto TV news and that inspired the change.org petition. And then, you know, media, social media played back and forth, but it's this whole complicated media ecosystem like why we're talking about the stories that we talk about each day. There's lots of people battling over the, that framing, right? And so I, I thought it was fascinating how these different platforms play with each other and, and change is definitely one of them. Matt, you should share that case study. We'd love to share it with our network. Namrata, are there uh, toolkits uh, that citizen activists can use? First of all, Matt, thank you for the shout out. I'm, I feel like telling my colleagues in 18 countries uh, you know, when, uh, when when somebody says something nice about the campaigns we do and have a personal story to tell, we're always very excited. Um, yeah, in fact, you know, a couple of days ago, we put together a resource, which is like our campaigning 101 website. It just breaks down, um, you know, how to how to campaign. And we, we really believe in knowledge sharing um, and, you know, helping people just sort of uh, do exactly what we do as a team to support citizens. Um, Pratima, I've shared the link with you, and if you can share it with the people who are watching, watching us, that would be great. Um, what we really, like, it, it just pretty much breaks down into telling people how to identify what to campaign on, how to grow that campaign, make it successful. Media campaigning is something we definitely uh, advocate very strongly because um, often journalists can be allies, especially those who do investigative pieces. Um, I remember I was in Bangalore two years ago, and in the Times of India Bangalore edition, there was a mention of uh, a training school for the hearing impaired that was going to be uh, demolished to build a metro station. And um, I happened to read this paper when I was at a workshop where two participants actually uh, had a personal connect to that issue. One of them uh, was raised by parents who had hearing impairment. And the other girl was partially hearing impaired. And the two of them almost wept when they read about this training institute being demolished. So what they did was they actually connected with the journalist once they started the campaign. Um, and he had a ton of resources in terms of people in government, people, uh, different NGOs. And he connected these two women to this entire coalition that was working. And... Uh, what they did was they eventually got a meeting with the commissioner for disabilities in, in Karnataka. And he was extremely sympathetic. And as a result, uh, the Bangalore Metro Rail um, company said that they would not demolish 
the school until it was relocated and the students were safely rehabilitated in a new building. So this was like a great example for us of how the media can be allies. If you, um, again, spend a little bit of time and energy in identifying journalists who uh, have a proven record of uh, doing this kind of activist journalism, if we can call it that. Uh, another platform I would love to call out uh, is Youth Ki Awaaz. It's a platform that a lot of people use in India. It, it, that's a site that basically uh, hosts like a blog and everybody can be published there. Um, that's a place to also uh, spread awareness, gain support, and uh, take all that support with you when you want to like, talk to somebody in government. Thanks, Namrata, for sharing that example. It reminds me of one uh, of a similar example that happened in Mumbai. So under the one of the flyovers in Lower Perel, close to KEM Hospital, so for those who don't know, KM Hospital is one of these big mega cancer hospitals. People come from out of town, but they don't have space or they don't have accommodation in Mumbai. So these relatives of the patients would rest under the flyover on the road and sleep the night over there. And um, I think it was uh, Mumbai Mirror of the midday that carried the article. And immediately Dr. Sangeeta Hasnale, who's one of the assistant municipal commissioners of MCGM, she um, uh, you know, picked it up and got uh, those people housed somewhere. So you know, the BMC actually has housing, except that nobody knows about it for these relatives. And I think uh, we are in a world where even the civic officials are using uh, all forms of media, social media, like uh, Pratima said, Shishma Swaraj, um, you know, when she was alive, she would, as foreign minister, respond to people's tweets but um, several other bureaucrats also they respond very quickly when uh, it appears on social media nobody wants bad publicity and they want to be seen doing something and um, whilst i'm talking about dr sangeeta hasnali i want to remind everyone that last month we hosted our utc where namrata spoke uh, our urban thinkers campus was on um, safe and inclusive cities, but uh, we had a citizen action lab component where we asked people to take action. And so now they are coming on the 5th of October at 6 p.m. to tell us what action they have implemented or are in the midst of implementing or plan to. And we are inviting all of you to join them so that you can help them uh, further their action or strengthen their action. And I've asked Pratima to put in the link on the chat section. So, I, you know, at this point, I have no choice but to read on Margaret Mead's quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So we have the power to do that. And this was the, the entire conversation was all about it. All the civic tools, civic media that is available to you. We have the power to um, implement change and hold our governments accountable. It may seem daunting because, you know, putting your opinion out there is not easy. It's uh, very difficult because there'll be for every one person who agrees with you, maybe 10 people might disagree with you. But remember, there are many people listening on social media. They're not actively saying anything. And I'm a, I'm a great um, uh, example of that because, as you know, Every day I'm on some live cast or the other, either speaking at somebody's event or hosting my own. And I think, oh, nobody's listening. But when I wish someone happy birthday and I make it a point to wish people a happy birthday, Facebook has those alerts. People always say, you know, we we uh, love all your podcasts. We love all your live casts. And you bring the most amazing guests. And they're very thoughtful. And they're very uh, stimulating conversations. And it always takes me by surprise because I think maybe nobody is listening. Maybe nobody has the time anymore. We are zoomed out. But I tell you, people are listening. They're consuming. They may not put their opinion out there. So you be brave. You put your opinion out there. Use all the civic tools. Today, we heard so many of those examples. Check out that civic tech dot guide that Matt shared with us. Uh, you know, use youth key of ours. Use change.org. We have used change.org. And I'm going to take a moment to tell everyone how we've used it for the domestic violence petition. So as you know, during COVID-19, uh, domestic violence has spiked. 
all over the world but in india too and uh, we put in a petition a public interest litigation at the supreme court to make uh, to declare the domestic violence prevention services as essential and as usual the court you know guided us back to the government to write the guidelines so it's gone into a black hole but we've mobilized people on change.org it's got almost 30000 signatures so go check out our petition sign it because we need to put pressure covid-19 is not yet over we'll always go through lock and unlock um, periods of time and during that time we don't want somebody to be deprived of services it could be somebody you love so i'm going to stop there but i'm going to pass it on to pratima to say a few words No, I think this was great, and I think uh, thanks to Matt and Namrata for sharing these uh, toolkits uh, with the community because I think um, you know that's it, it. It was such a kind of uh, kind of huge directory of resources available uh, for them to start their own campaign. So thank you, Namrata and Matt, for sharing that. And I again want to re-emphasize that. Uh, Uh, we are hosting uh, the urban thinkers uh, campus not the urban thinkers campus we are hosting a panel on the world habitat day and i'm just going to uh, highlight that uh, uh, link so all of you can sign up it's on october 5th um and we have a we have a group of citizen activists who have their own campaign ideas and i hope they learned a lot from this session as well so it's bit.ly/urban-action so please sign up and join us and uh, uh you know encourage all the citizen activists who are coming with coming up with their plan for more inclusive uh cities and before we go matt and namrata my final question to you both is uh, you know what do you think is the biggest kind of uh, challenge with civic tech um you know especially for citizens who want to put it to use what are the biggest challenges or um obstacles that we can face as citizens while we put this uh, technology to use matt yeah well, first of all thank you so much for having me it's really an honor it's my first live cast of any kind <laughs> um in terms of obstacles i think about you know civic literacy you know why do people feel that like they're speaking up will matter if they've been told their whole life that their voice doesn't matter um tech literacy you know are you going to know how to use the latest tech when you're trying to you know keep your kids going to school and finding food for the table so take care of some of these foundational layers first but then lastly just the imagination the the belief that government can be good for mm-hmm. all of us is a lot of work and that's i know in the us sometimes we have people there it's an active debate about whether we should come together collectively and do big things through the public sector right. and it, it's wild to me um so just this this imagination and like if you look at whether it's the post office or the drug administration like uh, why knows in civic tech is a lot of people start on the outside of government they start as critics they start as reformers they want to tear down the bad government and then eventually they realize like oh wait all of us we are we are the government and the, a lot of them right. have gone inside and now they're they're becoming the incumbents they're responsible now for fixing the system from the inside even though they set out you know against the system on the outside so i think the biggest barrier is just seeing government and public sector as something that we're all a part of and that can actually be good for all of us and and in my even in my own case exceed our own expectations thanks man i think uh, it was it is this quote by uh, plato the old philosopher on uh, how citizens are the most important political office and i think uh, civic tech can really enable that right like it can really allow us to participate in governance and policy making in its true sense so yeah thanks for that namrata challenges in um, some of these civic tech tools Yeah I think plus one to what Matt said about um civic literacy digital literacy um I think a big barrier is also um the fact that we live in such a polarized world where increasingly a lot of people are becoming extremely cynical and skeptical uh and I think there's a huge trust deficit that seems to be growing um I think it's important there's also um a lot of calling out of privilege that needs to happen because 
um in india for example there is internet penetration but um in a, in every household if you might look in the villages as well there may be a smartphone but it's usually the male of the house who has access to it and not his daughter or his wife um so i'm a little i'm i'm a little worried about the fact that maybe it is still just the privileged who are able to access these digital tools and uh, we need to wait for digital literacy and internet penetration to increase to a point where the most vulnerable and the most marginalized like the last mile population is also able to access these tools um because currently what's happening is that someone is speaking for them um people in mumbai who are campaigning for the tribals in the ra forest are still residents who come from neighborhoods of privilege i would love to see a world where all these barriers can be crossed so that the the so people can speak up for themselves thank you namrata and thank you matt i have had such a wonderful um, session i have learned so much and it stimulated a lot of ideas so thank you once again for sharing your time with us and your knowledge and thank you everyone for joining and i'll see you on monday please check the link out thanks pratima